Hello, I'm Sandra Higgins, and uh, we're filming tonight from the viewing room, Hansard Muse. It's a pop-up gallery. I have a space in Bath, and I've come to London to exhibit the 18 distinguished artists that I have in my online gallery. I feel that artists should speak for themselves, and I think the best way to get artists to express themselves, because in the past they've told me they're hesitant, they don't want to write about their work, they don't want to speak about it. And when you have artists in dialogue with one another, similar artists or dissimilar, talking about the similarities and the dissimilarities, they sometimes come up with um, splendid observations of their own work as well. So I think it's a very exciting thing to do. Fiona McIntyre and Louisa Bernard Hall are two colorist artists, and they're going to be discussing their palettes. Fiona is more, um, she probably hate this, an academic painter. So she applies her paints with a brush and sponges, but in a more uh, controlled way. Whereas Louisa is more spontaneous, paints flat, and um, uses uh, rags and her feet and whatever is necessary. So there's a tremendous amount of action in Louisa's paintings, and there's a, a, a lovely kind of uh, overlapping and atmosphere in Fiona's. Well, thanks for both of you coming along to the viewing room. I'm called you colorists, so do you think you are? I mean, that's, you know, that's my category. What do you think? Do you think you, how do you use color? I mean, what does it mean to you? What colors do you use? Maybe you could both chat about that a bit, yeah? Yeah. You want to go first? <laughs> uh, yeah, sure. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it's an interesting one, isn't it? What does it mean to be a colorist? Because obviously if you're a painter, you're going to be using color. Um, and there are lots of different ways of using it. Um, so I think it takes me back to my... I, we both studied at Edinburgh, which I think is an interesting similarity. Mm. But we were taught to start introducing tiny amounts of black into our palettes. But um, having done my first year in an English art school, they had a very different um, idea, and they were following the Impressionist palette where you absolutely were forbidden from using black, and you had to mix it, so you, had, you created a very pure black out of basically primary colours. So that might be an alizarin mixed with, a, say, a Prussian blue. I think my experience was a bit different. I was doing the art history and the painting, but we were both there at the same time. And I don't, nobody told me what to do. <laughs> we just had to find out and get on with it ourselves. So, um, and uh, I was actually really, there was lots of drawing, and I was really just enjoying using loads of charcoals and pencil and uh, oil pastels and mixing. And eventually it was all black and white, really, a lot of... Um, and then the printmaking, of course, black and white, and that's wonderful. So I think the colours were fairly literally related to the subjects, the subject matter, the still lives. I think I naturally used a lot of black and it wasn't a problem. For, you found it was a problem for you using um, black? I, I, well, I, I think I, I slightly struggled with it to begin with, but um, later I've embraced it. Um, because I realised that it actually you can develop a, a much broader range of really interesting hues. When when did um, you said later you embraced uh, the black and use of that? When was that? When was uh... um, actually relatively recently? I'd say probably about sort of three years ago, maybe. There is a tiny amount actually in these paintings here. Mm. What I mean by that is I'm not using raw black at all. I'm, I'm maybe I'm using very pure colours and then I'm introducing just a tiny, tiny little bit mm -hmm. of it to basically make what's known as a hue. And, so uh, you can mix a warm black or a cool black? Yeah, but you're not really mixing the black. What you're doing is you're darkening the colour in a very, very subtle way, but you have to do it in a very subtle way. I find um, where I've lived it's really a affected the kind of my palette and uh, um, so Edinburgh was very strong when I was using colours they were very strong colours because there's, there's that strong light it's very vibrant and there's that red earth of the borders and kind of the drunken trees along the <laughs> crests of the, the hills and uh, um, there's very particular lights there Would um, you describe that as a, it's a sort of northern light isn't it? Yeah, yeah 
Yeah. Where was it you went afterwards? Because you said you went. Well, to I went. Didn't you? I went to yeah. Sweden, so yeah. I lived there for seven years, and, mm. and so that's very much northern mm. light. And, yeah. um, but interestingly, um, I started introducing huge amounts of black into my work. Mm. It, it, you know, it's funny how one's palette can change mm. quite dramatically. And then it was only when I came back to the UK that color started. Pure colour started creeping, creeping back, mm. and um, and what really did it for me was a, a trip out to India. I spent a month completely immersed in baking hot sun down in the south, and I came back and it was really dramatic the effect on my on my painting. And suddenly I was making these incredibly vibrant, very gestural paintings and working on the floor as well, you know, lots of canvases and chucking paint at them. So I think you're right, I think environment is really important. Was it oil paint you were using? What was it, what technique was um, it? Well, I was using, ones? yeah, I was using, um, I veered between acrylic and oils actually, interestingly, mm. so I might sort of, um, the first layers might be acrylic, yeah. and, and then I would be using oils yeah. So, um, and then I went through a phase of only yeah. using acrylics mm. for about 10 years. Because I've just changed, I'm using acrylic a lot now. I might use a bit of oil to intensify the colour, but you can't chuck, well I find, I can't chuck oil in the same way as you can chuck acrylic. <laughs> Some of your works here deal with water. Is, that's been a theme with your work for a long time, hasn't it? Lisa? Yeah, I've yeah. been working on theme, I think, almost for almost 30 years now. Mm. It, uh, before, before that, I was working a lot from landscape and uh, theme of movement and the rocks and layers and what's visible, what's invisible. It's really uh, what interests me. And then I'd gone, I'd just gone to an aquarium um, and taken a few photos and when I got them back, it was like, ah, this is it, because it was the web of light on the surface and you could see reflection above, you could see uh, sort of fish below, but bits of them, so just sort of bits of colour. So yeah. when you were doing landscape, were you using more earth colours? The Scottish ones were earth colours, I'd say. Um, and so then... Ochres, yeah. Sienas. Yeah. But then with the bright greens as well, because it rains a lot, so vegetation would be very strong, could be got strong greens. Mm -hmm. Then uh, in the early 90s, I'd done a series based on the ochre quarries in uh, Roussillon in the south of France. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And those were really sort of hot, sort of, there were reds and oranges and yellows and there were lots of swirling movement. I, I, I like the energy in landscape and I think that's, uh, um, but I think that's what I was thinking. My work's really all about movement theme of water, I first started looking at, um, I was still quite figurative, I think the landscape was more stronger figurative elements, whereas I'm happily looking straight at water, and the, which is so abstract in itself. I was looking at fish within water, how there's a lot of optical, you know, there's refraction, reflection, fragmentation, that interested me as well, different spatial dimensions in fact, but of course you end up with a lot of blue and I do enjoy blue. Water is a uh, is it like a, it's a narrative or a story and it's constantly flowing or we hope it will be constantly flowing and each picture is like a little slice in time mm -hmm. and so in fact for this series I'd, so I'd spent a, a week in this place and I'd done sketches and they followed along a stretch of stream so the composition there's actually 12 in all so the composition is connected, but each section is, is individual. Although the first three do work well, as a, I do tend to work on two or three at once, and the first three seem, can be grouped together. You both spent a lot of time in Iceland, didn't you? Yeah. That's a, that's yeah. a piece of yeah. it. And you have a series in the browser called Continuum. Yeah. Yes. And then um, you you created a series as well, if you, know, you, you compare yes, your experiences right. in Iceland. Yeah, that is interesting, isn't yeah. it? I, I wanted to go, I think looking for this energy, that's why I wanted to go, and I yes. wanted to see waterfalls and so on. Yeah. I was not disappointed. <laughs> not so was was that your point. first trip to Iceland? Yeah, yeah. So it, was, um, it wasn't that long, but uh, I got a lot of material from it, and then I worked afterwards uh, back in the studio, which is often, as I always have worked, I've gone out, got my material, and come back. And yeah, done the work so that's studio. similar to how I work, really. Yeah. Going and immersing... You, 
yourself within the landscape, yeah. getting to know because you have to build a sort of relationship with it, don't you? Yeah. And then, and then, you, and and sort of building up lots of different types of memories, not just mm. visual, but mm. you know what I call muscle memories and mm. you know sounds that you hear and smells and everything, and then take that all back into the studio. Yeah. Well, it was it was very short my my trip, but it was uh, it was summer times so of the days. It was almost like it was twice as long because the days were so long. Because it was July, so it was hardly any night. At the time, I was working a lot on. Uh, um, I would use. Uh, uh, it's called Brou de Noir in French. It's the walnuts. Um, oh yes, walnuts. Ground walnuts yeah. or something. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, so you've been yes. using it. I was using that. Pigment. I would. I would just yeah. do that. Well, I had bottles of the pigment, and some oh. were. were Coloured as well. I'm not sure what way, but when I I got them in Belgium, mm. um, and uh, just from art, an art shop, I thought oh, that looks interesting. Mm. And you can make a huge quantity with just a teaspoon or two. And uh, um, so I would use those to create the first layers or the composition or the. the so that's what's meant very gestural. And mm. then I was working with oil pastel mm. afterwards. Um, they're really quite, oh, that's quite really big, interesting, big, big drawings. So you both said that you are, and I think you were particularly interested in the energy um, in landscape and in water, and I wondered whether you feel therefore very affected by climate change and what's going on in the world, and when you really look at the climate or you look at trees, you are influenced by the thing that you read in the papers and know that's going on in the world as well. I'd say yes. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> definitely. 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 How could you not be? Exactly. Um, I mean, especially as an artist. I mean, and especially yeah. because we're both interacting with the landscape. The theme of water, I, I do feel, is you know, it's more precious than gold. I've always yeah. felt it. And when I went to the Iceland, some of the work I did on the glaciers, I was using a lot of uh, sort of snow, but there was a lot of um, bright reds involved, which was used. Um, in an expressive way, partly because down below the surface there was the volcano simmering away and you weren't quite sure when it would explode, but also because the ice was melting and, uh, and so yes. there's, uh, what looked cold to us is uh, actually uh, unnaturally warm. I sort of rejected acrylics. Um, I had a bit of a, a sort of epiphany where I... I don't know, I reacted against the fact that I suppose I realised it was basically liquid plastic. Um, and um, so I, I actually went back to oils and then I wanted to um, go even further back. Um, so I started uh, sourcing materials myself, with, such as ochres, which you can mm. source very easily locally in almost any part of the world. Perhaps our, our interests in, in some of these materials is in part a reaction. Um, With the I don't know what you think, but I, I certainly feel that it's, for me, it's been a reaction. Mm. Um, I think it's, it started off as a subconscious thing, maybe mm. when I um, decided to start understanding um, natural, purer materials, so to speak. Mm. Um, and uh, it, it's and what what happens is you take they take you on an adventure. You go back in time, you, and you, and then you start discovering all the ancient history, and it's absolutely fascinating. I just can't thank you enough for coming along and sharing your your opinions with us. And um, thank you so much, all of you, for coming and participating in your questions. And um, you know, we've had a great time. Thanks. Yeah.